Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Fuel Arts, Art and Tech online webinar series where, where we are mixing the two worlds, the worlds of art, tech, and venture capital. My name is Denis Belkevich. I'm the um, CEO and co-founder of Fuel Arts, and with me, Sonia Stubblebine, the project manager, Fuel Arts, and head of content. So, as you know, the Throughout the, the last three months, our webinars have been focused on the diversity of the Tezos ecosystem. Uh, for instance, those webinars introduced uh, you, our dear audience, to the managers, curators, founders, technical experts, and artists working to develop the, the number one blockchain for the art, which is Tezos. And uh, again, we are thrilled to invite you to the demo day of Fuel Arts and Tess Accelerator uh, taking place on April 27th, right in a week. So after two and a half months of intense acceleration, we are proud to present you the 10 startups from eight different countries, all leveraging the power of Web3 technology to drive the next wave of innovation. Uh, we believe that you'll be interested in this exclusive event uh, where you will have the possibilities and the opportunities to discover the, the most innovative art tech startups uh, of the year, supported by, by Tezos. Uh, let me introduce uh, our lineup to you briefly. And meanwhile, you can go to um, our website, fuelarts.com, and register uh, for the uh, for this extensive event for the demo day. So Aerarium Chain from Italy. This is a SaaS solution to support museums from preservation to crowdfunding through NFTs. Um, another, yes, the Art Square uh, from the UK, the Blue Chip Art Fractional Shares Exchange, the new Art NASDAQ. Uh, Cheney from France, the first Netflix economy platform for collectibles. Uh, Comic 3.0 from the USA uh, will introduce the next generation of graphic storytelling for Web3, also using AI products. Uh, Econa Space from the Netherlands, uh, widely known in uh, Web2, but now they are tapping into Web3 proposing a social network to display and share, share artworks online. Uh, Kaleido, Kaleido from the USA, the place where physical art and digital experience collide. Um, M1X Labs, also from the USA, the NFT discovery and creation dApp on the Tezos blockchain. Uh, they work on the intersection of art and music. NFTs. NFT Biennial. Everyone is everyone visits uh, Venice Biennial and 600 other biennials around the world, but this is the first art NFT biennial. Also worth to explore. Um, yeah, Fidgetal Plus. Fidgetal Plus, the AI guys, uh, a no-code AI workplace workspace, sorry, for art design tech and Web3 startups like um, ChatGPT in your pocket. And PromptC, PromptC from Japan. Uh, with this platform, you could securely share AI artworks and prompts with special permission NFT. So again, please feel free to register for, for the demo day, which will happen in a week next Thursday. And yeah, for, for that, uh, please go to the website, fuelize.com and um, express your interest by clicking, the, um, by clicking the button register. That's very simple. So our last webinar before the demo day, um, devoted to the Tezos art ecosystem, will be devoted to AI and generative art. And for that, we were very happy to invite Ivona Tao, or better say, Dr. Ivona Tao, if to uh, say official, uh, a generative AI artist from Vilnius, Lithuania. 
uh, who works with neural networks and code as a medium in experimental photography and mo uh, motion painting. So Ivona creates universally relatable memories by transforming her experiences capture or, uh, captured on analog and digital film through generative neur neural networks known as GAN. So Ivona's artworks have been exhibited widely, including uh, Art Basel, Miami Beach Scope, CAFA, Art Week, Shenzhen, Vellum, um, Beatforms, New York, Venus over Manhattan, the House of uh, Fine Art, and um, also were exhibited and both sold at Sotheby's New York. So an extensive and great career for an NFT uh, artist. Hi, Ivona, and thank you for joining us. Hi, Dennis. Thank you so much for your lovely introduction. Uh, and Sonia, I as well, very happy to be here on this Hi. webinar. Thank you so much for agreeing. We're very excited about starting this webinar. I think we have very interesting questions today, and we're ready to dive into generative art and, about, and to know more about you and your art in general. Yes, you know, uh, half a year ago, in half a year ago, uh, in November 2022, everyone was predicting 2023 will be a year of generative art. It was all about generative art, and we also had webinars. Prior, we uh, started partnering with uh, Tezos, but after that, it was all about AI art. So, um, and nowadays, uh, it may seem to someone that AI art and generative art are contradicting with each other, which isn't true in our opinion, in fact. So our first question to you, Ivana, will be, okay, what would be your personal definition of generative art? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, of course. This is a topic that... Um, many people and not only people even chat gpt has been asked that many times i guess what's the difference between generative and ai art and my personal opinion is um quite similar i think to the common conception that ai art is a subgenre of generative art which means that generative art is art that is created by rules by algorithms by computers, but it does not even need to have a computer. You can have a set of rules or have a performance or something like Soloid has done where you don't really need a computer, but you have this randomness. You have this additional element of something guiding the work where the author does not have the full control over it. AI art is... Uh, is all of that uh, as well, but it is a narrower field in a way that we are using neural networks. And there are many different neural networks. There are neural networks that work in a text to image manner, something that is currently most popular, but there are also different methods. For example, the networks that I am using, GANs, which don't really use text or language in any way, and they just learn from examples, uh, examples provided by me through vast data sets. But there are also different other AI methods with generative sound, generative text, and, and many, many others. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess this, this would be um, my definition. AI is using neural networks, and generative is guided by algorithms. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana, for, for, for that uh, smart definition. Uh, I really believe that ChatGPT is now listening to you <laughs> and will Learning. include your expansive uh, reply into their uh, commodity. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's actually a very interesting question in general to distinguish these two terms and just discuss that. Also, we're very curious about your personal path. What was your journey into generative art and how it started? Uh, yes, yeah, so my, my journey started with photography and this is why I even sometimes describe my practice as experimental photography as well as generative photography 
post photography, there are many terms that I feel are quite liquid in a way that the definitions are not really uh, defined yet. And uh, I really came into the field of AI art through the intersection of photography on one hand side, but also computer science on the other. So uh, my background is like this perfect story in a way of combining art and technology because I've been uh, practicing traditional photography, but then I also went on to study mathematics and computer science. And then I got fascinated with computer vision neural networks and AI in a broader sense. And I realized that there are ways to combine the two and uh, they don't really need to be separate. And uh, this is when I discovered that there is this whole field of generative art. This is something that, to be honest, uh, when I stumbled upon that, I was, I was really surprised that I didn't hear about it. When I thought about art created with algorithms, um, I thought, well, maybe fractals or something from mathematics, but I didn't really know this whole field existed until I started my own experiments with uh, early neural networks um, in 2019. So uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a really interesting journey, a very, very personal path of exploration of just trying different things. And, and seeing what works and uh, uh, not really going by the book, um, which is also very fun because uh, this is the way that you can really find your very personal way and also something that really inspires and fascinates you most. Great. Uh, thank you, Ivana. Uh, I mean, from, from what I heard from you, uh, and I also find that, reasonable so the the path of the artist uh, is like a cheeseburger with, with a lot of slices so <laughs> passion research studying passion research studying so it's it, it's uh, quite an endless process and i re really like uh hearing um that from you because nowadays unfortunately from the most of the instagram accounts of the artists who want to to seem professional we understand that the we, we may we may think that the the working day of a professional artist starts with uh, a cup of coffee uh, cup, a cup of coffee then he or she wears absolute crisp white dress uh, takes <laughs> pencil and starts uh, starts painting of course of course uh, that's that's the the outer side but the inner side i mean the internal side is um uh, is um let's say uh less posh so we'd like to to ask you as the the real artist uh, what does the creative process for generative artists look like so what tools do you use and uh, in um uh, yeah it's more general but again how does your working day start uh, yeah, as, as you say, it's a lot more messy and a little less structured. Um, for me, the way I start the day is, is usually by turning on my computer very quickly, checking if my models are running, if my models are training, uh, what have they learned through the night. Uh, so if I'm training something, it means that a model can run for a few days and uh, it's a very long process that requires patience. Uh, so it's really fascinating to see what happened during those eight hours where I was asleep. Uh, and sometimes, well, sometimes it's, it's fascinating. Sometimes it's also disappointing. It's not every model that you train is something interesting and something that you really like or something that is uh, something that you want to share. So... Um, I don't know the percentage, but I would say most of the models uh, are not something I, I share. So 20% of those would be like uh, the ones that see the light. Um, so yeah, but, but you, it, this also happens in the process. So even if there is a model that gives me absolute garbage, I might see, well, what the problem here. So uh, maybe I need to go back 
to the data. Uh, maybe I need to change the parameters of the model. This is really a long path of trials and errors and, and mistakes and happy accidents also, because uh, in some cases, it's also the unexpected happens that you train on one data set your model and suddenly the results uh, show something absolutely unexpected. And this is what I'm really searching for when training the models. Something that I didn't even knew was there in the data or maybe a different way of how AI interprets things that are in my images. So when I find something like that, I would go deeper into this particular thing and would think, okay, so what do I do next? Uh, in this model, I like those five images. So now I want to create them, but better, but uh, more detailed, more colorful, or, or maybe I am just curious on how to mix those with something different. So. Uh, so the process is very unstructured in a way that in the beginning I had this data set and I had this idea what I want to do, but then when I go on and train it, I suddenly might realize many different things and many different paths that I can take and it would really be guided by that. So then I would go back to dirty cleaning the data, going for the images, uh, finding what works. So a lot of the process is actually quite boring <laughs> to watch for uh, bystanders. Uh, so uh, sometimes I try to record like behind the scenes videos, but it's it really looks better when you're painting on easel as opposed to when you're coding on your computer, uh, uh, especially uh, writing some Python scripts uh, where there are even no images in it. So uh, definitely not as glamorous, <laughs> but um, but the data collection part um, is is more interesting, also in a way that it requires going out to the world and shooting very often and creating some new images that I then uh, show to AI, and then also there is my probably favorite part of the process, which is interacting with a trained model. And for me, it's a very uh, even meditative process because when the model has finally learned something useful, when the model finally is giving me something that I really like, uh, it's just this very magical experience. Um, and again, I don't use any kind of text prompts. So I just go on through this whole space of all the possibilities and just look at the images and go into different directions and just go on and explore. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a very meditative for me uh, as well in a way that this is the, the final result uh, of your hard work. And this is the point where you find absolute enjoyment in, in discovering uh, all those visuals and then creating the narrative, finding the narrative, finding how it answers the creative question you had in the beginning. Uh, yeah, so the process is messy and structured, uh, sometimes tedious, but uh, has those magical moments that make it all worthwhile. Thank you for sharing that. I think it was very valuable because I'm sure a lot of people, they don't know what is, you know, behind the process. They don't know yeah. what, you know, what it took you to create those, in, like, those pieces. So I think this is a very valuable explanation. Also talking about, you know, how people perceive value, how do you understand, like, for example, for collectors, what kind of value, you know, you see uh, in generative art? Uh, yeah, so um, definitely I'd say that there are two parts and there are two very different schools with regards to value in generative art. And some creators really like the final outputs to be meaningful of value. So this image is beautiful aesthetically uh, or maybe evokes emotions and this is why it's valuable. While on the other hand, uh, the other school of generative artists uh, really gives the most value to algorithm itself and they work very hard on fine tuning all the possibilities so that there is still randomness, but also every 
possible outcome from this algorithm is something that tells a story. So there is this uh, play of curation against randomness and um, very, uh, very differently artists usually approach that. And uh, I also experimented with the bow. So in the beginning, I, I usually created my works animations uh, in a very curated manner that every frame is something that I wanted to make sure that is perfect and is in place. And the story is, is perfectly told. But uh, what, was, um, what was scary, but at the same time uh, quite liberating, was to work in this opposite manner of developing long-form generative art it was so much more difficult, I must say, for me. So I definitely find it easier to create this one perfect output as opposed to creating this algorithm. Especially in the case of AI, it means that you have to train this perfect model uh, that not only creates 50% uh, or 80% of visual outputs that are pleasing to you aesthetically or meaningfully, but it needs to have the accuracy of like 99%, so that you could be proud of that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a very different job because you just guide those knobs and, and see where the randomness uh, falls within. Um, but yeah, I, I see value in, in both of them. Thank you, thank you, Ivana. Um... You said that you, you tapped into digital art, into generative art back in 2019. That was the year when Tazas was created. And of course, your first steps couldn't be uh, realized on the Tazas blockchain. So what was your first impression of Tazas? When did you he hear about it? And what were your first interactions with the Tazas art ecosystem? How do you decide to start working on Tazas? Uh, yeah, so so actually, I, I've heard of Tezos because I was following a few AI artists, uh, and not only AI artists and generative artists, but a few other people that I kind of treated as, um, as you know, knowledgeable in this space. They started talking about this very cryptic platform, Hiketnang, that I was uh, quite curious about. But then when I saw how it works, I was so confused and I said, well, I don't have time for that. <laughs> it, it looks weird. Uh, but then I saw more and more people uh, kind of tweeting about it, talking about it. Uh, there was this article by Jenny Lemercier about the ecological aspects of, of uh, Tezos. And uh, well, I, I became more and more curious. And one day I decided, OK, I, I have to figure it out. <laughs> Maybe Google that or go to some forums and realize how do I mint on this thing? And how do I get this Tezos thing? Um, so yeah, it was, it was around uh, one month after uh, Hikat Nank was actually um, made uh, live. Uh, I remember that uh, specifically because for the first 30 days, they were uh, giving out the uh, the tokens. So I was like, just few days, uh, few days, a few last days to, to receive the age DAO, which nowadays is no longer like live or valuable of anything, but it's a very sentimental kind of token uh, to get. That just means that you were there quite early, uh, early days of Picket Nunk. And uh, yeah, it was a very funny experience. I minted my first work there uh, for one test, one of one. <laughs> I was very surprised to see it go very quickly because I thought it's such a niche platform. No one is it. Uh, no one is on it. And yeah, it was just for fun. So in this collection, the second work went for like two tests, then four, 10, 20. And I was really surprised to uh, see this audience grow and find uh, people who were interested in my work because at the time I was involved in artistic practice for a long time but not very professionally. I participated in a few shows but I never considered uh, to be making a living uh, from art. It was more as a passion thing in my free time as I made my living as an AI engineer. 
So I was really surprised uh, to see this interest uh, for my work on this platform. And yeah, to be honest, it was also Tezos was uh, the platform where I grew uh, quite a lot, uh, surprisingly, in such a short time uh, and a few years. I've had so many uh, shows all because of uh, Tezos, I could say, because, yeah, it was the platform that uh, connected me with some some of the influential people as well, some people from the traditional art space. Uh, it seemed very hipster and niche and underground, but uh, as it appeared uh, underneath all many of those cryptic uh, token wallet addresses, there was uh, yeah, some, some actual people that I was very happy to meet. That sounds very inspiring. It seems like, you know, for you, it was like a big impact on your career. And also, I've read that Absolutely. you also been on FX Hash, right? So could you tell us more about this experience? How would you describe it? I would kind of say, probably from what I yeah. read, something positive, but could you tell us more? Yeah, absolutely. So FX Hash is actually the moment when, uh, as I mentioned before, I decided suddenly to go into more long form. And it was my first experiment in long form. Before FX Hash, I only published individual works, individual <laughs> outputs uh, from the models. Uh, but then when I discovered generative art and code-based art, I also discovered processing, P5.js, and also the amazing works of the generative artists that have been using different tools, but they were still using um, code and they were still using algorithms, which essentially is the same thing as AI, it's just different algorithms and, and different uh, kind of tool set. Uh, so I started learning that um, and, uh, and I really wanted to, um, to do something. I treated it as a, also again, very dirty experiment uh, just something that I thought would be cool to combine AI outputs with code on top. And also uh, in my first FX hash project, I also involved generative text. So there were many layers of different tool sets, but also many layers of different of my personal experiences because there was some film photographs uh, from from my adolescent times, and there are also some texts that were uh, representative of a conversation you could have with AI. So, so yeah, it was a, a very fun experiment that I also approached in a way that, well, let's just do something just for myself. Let's learn something new. Uh, let's go outside of my usual practice. Let's go outside of just using GANs and let's uh, learn something new. So uh, so yeah, I was absolutely overwhelmed uh, with the reception also on FX Hash uh, that I got. I realized that there is an amazing community also uh, on FX Hash. Uh, when FX Hash appeared, the Tezos grew quite big, so it also became uh, more mainstream, uh, even though still very much focused on artists and very much focused on quality, well, not only quality art, but real art where you don't really uh, need to care about, you know, how you're perceived. Uh, so this kind of energy, this raw energy, I feel it also um, reflected on FX Hash and all on the early uh, projects. Um, yeah, so, it was uh, it was a very uh, very cool experience, and uh, with the next projects as well, uh, I was very honored to be at uh, Art Basel with FX Hash and do a live minting experience there, uh, which also meant that people who are just stumbling by at this uh, huge um, uh, huge thing can you know have their first NFT, and um, yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Ivana. Uh, I should uh, I should say we've <clears throat> we witnessed your uh, success at Art Basel because we visited at it. Oh, amazing! In, in both, uh, yeah, twenty one, twenty two. I mean, in Miami Beach. But uh, um, closer to closer to the end of two thousand twenty two, there there have been a lot of speculations about the 
possible negative impact of AI on the general image of art, like back in 19th, middle of the 19th century when the first camera shots appeared. Yeah. And the artists thought that camera cameraman would be competitors towards artists before they realized it's more craft than art. And then they got calm and started exploring impressionism, post-impressionism, and uh, dealing, de de dealing with art, but not with competition. So uh, the same with, with AI there, as I said, there have been speculations that like a lot of artists or better say, common people without an artistic education uh, will receive the tools to create art and that will reduce the value of, of the whole meaning of art because I mean, uh, it won't be so easy to uh, distinguish good art from bad art. Of course, we, we disagree with it and we, we also help the, the, the webinar, appropriate webinar with the AI specialist back in December 22. But uh, what's your personal take on AI and uh, could it potentially ruin the basis and the, the good name of art? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, your comparison to photography is uh, absolutely in place here. And uh, the one thing that I really like to tell is, well, nowadays, everyone can take an amazing photograph, right? But no, not everyone is a photographer. And it also doesn't mean that photography as an art genre does not exist. So I believe that this is a very natural path for AI as well. And it would just mean that in a close future, when the AI access is so democratized that everyone is able to create high quality content, it doesn't mean that everyone is an artist. And also it doesn't mean that artists don't exist. It's just artists still do the things they're doing. And being artist is, is also not a craftsmanship, but it's more about having a story to tell it's more about evoking emotions in viewers. It's more about having a conversation about relevant topics. And those things, uh, they won't disappear regardless of what happens with technology. Technology can help us do those things, but the message is, is something important. So the message is something that is still so uniquely human uh, that uh, I believe even the use of AI uh, does not really mean that art can just be created on its own and can be mitigated to machines as opposed to humans. So uh, maybe it's one of the last things that we have <laughs> that cannot be done uh, by AI uh, completely. Um, but nonetheless, um, I feel that it's, it's amazing that we had those incredible tools. Um, but uh, it's, it still just means that the practice might change. And it's also very fascinating to see how different mediums will evolve, uh, especially as we see with photography now being replicated so well with AI. Uh, people start and artists start realizing that creating a realistic photograph um, with AI is, is not really the key because, well, we have photography for that, but we can explore new applications of AI and also think about the ways what AI can do that photography can't. So for example, there might be some places where we cannot go or situations that cannot exist, or maybe just different ways of how AI envisions the reality. So we can leverage this ability of AI to just go through thousands of photographs, millions of photographs, and create something, generalize something that human brain cannot do. And uh, as artists, we can think of ways, how can we use that to, to our benefit to tell an even more provocative story, even more interesting story. So, yeah, I'm really curious to see which way it evolves, both AI art, which way it will go, but also where photography will go and maybe even painting uh, and other mediums. Uh, they, of course, can be impacted, but 
uh, they will definitely will not be replaced. So yeah, in my view, uh, all the artists, even illustration artists, uh, can can be safe as long as they think about the reasons and motivations why they do their practice. Thank you, thank you for your uh, long and extensive and uh, reply full of personal passion. The only thing I, I wanted to add, yeah, I didn't want to to offend photography because. Sure, I, I miss to say that uh, nowadays, and better say, starting from the end of the 19th century, they have uh, better say, starting from the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the the division between art photography and uh, and craft photography uh, was narrowed, and, and and now we understand that there is fine art photography, and let's say the photography for everyday use for for some practical usage yeah absolutely i think it will happen with ai as well Ivana, i also want to ask you about the misconceptions around generative art because i feel like i would love to know your perspective you've been there in a space for a long time what have you heard so far what were the most like surprising things what are the most like common things that you hear about generative art what are the misconceptions uh, yeah, so one of the things is that currently text-to-image tools are so popular that most of the population uh, um, thinks that AI, well, AI in general, is uh, is using text. And uh, it's just a small portion of all the models that exist there. And also a lot of AI artists are not even using text. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I've talked with other AI artists who are, uh, coincidentally also not using prompts, but, uh, when you post something on Instagram and you get like in comments, so what was the prompt you used? And well, the reality is that there was no prompt or maybe the prompt was just used for other artists as part of the image, part of their process. So um it's very easy to think that well it was created by by just using a prompt uh another misconception that i hear is about training the model so something that something that really does not happen when you interact with such models as delhi or Midjourney, because i've heard a lot of the people think that when you use those prompts and interact with those models this is how they learn but the truth is that during inference or test time, how we call that in AI, is no learning happens. So even if you use very personal prompts, the only thing that happens is this platform can like have this history of the prompts you used, but AI itself is not learning. So unless the company decides, okay, let's run another set of training and let's use all the data some ways, uh, only then will the additional training happen. And uh, yeah, also the thing about inference and training is something that is, I believe, still quite confusing to people uh, when they use AI. And, um, and also the fact about um, creating images with AI. Uh, very easy way to understand AI but which is not very true is that AI works as a sort of a collage maker that it takes one part from one image in the training data, different part from the different uh, image in the training data. Uh, but uh, it really works a bit differently uh, as it compresses all the information it has in the, in the data to something very abstract. So yeah, it can learn that humans have two hands, humans have five fingers, and then try to create something based on the knowledge it has seen in the training data, but it never really reuses any of the parts that it has seen in the training data uh, as, yeah, it would just not be technically possible uh, as the size of all those images usually is in yeah, many, many terabytes. And the model itself is like one gigabyte. So, so yeah, it would just not be technically possible to have this knowledge memorized and the model itself does not memorize uh, the images in any ways. Uh, yeah, I think these are like probably most common ones, but uh, essentially there is, there is many tricky parts and 
it's also not always necessary to understand how it works, you know, I like very detailedly. So it's, it's good to have some simplifications as, as long as they're like close to truth. Thank you for sharing thank that. Yeah, yeah, I think you wanna, be, before uh, we ask our next question, we have several reactions from, the, from our audience. Anna is expressing her admiration and thanks you for expanding art instrumentarium. And uh, Geoffrey, at contrary, says that AI is just a pretty empty shell. It's just a tool like Photoshop is. Would you like? Yeah, to I, I kind of agree. You know, uh, it's a tool. Uh, it's a very sophisticated tool, way more sophisticated than Photoshop. But it's still a tool set that artists can use. Uh, it's not. It's not a tool that can replace the most essential elements of the practice. It's not a tool that can um, replace purpose, motivation, meaning, and message. So yeah, in a way, it's it's just a tool like Photoshop, yeah. So everyone's right. Good. Uh, <laughs> that's why it, it, it it's even better. I mean, to to ask the following question uh, right now: How do you see the the generative art developing the future? Uh, yeah. So definitely, the tools will change a lot. We can see that already with the progress and new tools being introduced in such a crazy quick pace. It's very difficult to imagine what kind of tools we might have in five years. Uh, this is also why the practice of AI artists is quite unpredictable. Uh, you can, of course, stick to the older tools, but... Um, but it's yeah, it's, it's very similar to how photography developed. Uh, suddenly, everyone was using more advanced cameras. Suddenly, people switched to color photography, and the possibilities uh, became very, very different from those that were in the beginning. So I kind of imagine that we might go with AI a very similar route. Uh, right now, those models are still quite chunky to understanding information. They take a long time to train. Probably in a few years, the training will happen very fast as opposed to right now. It will also be even more easy to train the models. So unless you're using text-to-image tools, and as I mentioned, there is no training in there. So you still need some technical knowledge to train your AI. But as, as the time goes, I, I guess that both training AI models, but also writing code will become so easy that everyone will be able to do that. So it will just become uh, more accessible. Great. Thank you. And thank you for thank sharing you for, that. For, for, for asking questions and sharing their emotions. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Jeffrey. Absolutely. And we usually do this like traditional question. We're asking our guests for the tips. So we'd like to ask you three tips that you would give to emerging generative artists. What would you recommend to them? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, so uh, I don't know if I'll be very original, but <laughs> I'll just say, uh, yeah, just this honestly. So uh, the first one is, yeah, be patient. I think that it's like very underrated thing for artists to do, especially as we see so much happening so quick, quickly in this space and in generative space and in NFT space. Uh, it feels like um, very different from traditional art practice where artists usually work for a longer time on projects and waited longer for recognition. So uh, definitely patience is the key. Uh, yeah, the second one is also reiterating myself. Um, do art about yourself. So it's very tempting to tell a story that is not yours. Uh, but only we ourselves are the best ones to tell our own stories. And even if, even if we think that we have nothing to say, it's never true. And, uh, 
there is something that is so uh, truly yours that um, that is worthwhile telling. And the last one is don't be intimidated, especially uh, as generative art is not as democratized as it is. It might seem that it's very complicated to do. And those algorithms, those neural networks, they might seem very tricky. But um, you really don't need to understand how camera works under the hood to make pictures. And you can also just have the grasps of how the networks are working, how uh, some distributions are working, etc., to use those algorithms and to just explore and have fun. So, so yeah, have fun might be like bonus <laughs> tip. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. I think that, you know, gives inspiration, definitely very useful uh, tips for emerging artists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again, Ivona. Uh, that was that was an amazing talk. And we're happy that we have finished our three months marathon with Tezos related mm -hmm. webinars with a real hardworking, charming and successful artist. Thank you so much. Uh, it was definitely a pleasure to have this interview and thank you so much for your interesting questions. It was a pleasure for us. Thank you so much for today and thank you for your time. Thanks again and uh, see you in a week. Uh, hope, uh, hopefully you'll also join us during the demo day to look at the startups which we have uh, educated or better say, yeah, whatever. Mandel <laughs> educated, took care of spoke to uh we're nervous of and uh yeah th throughout the the last three months so see you in a week thanks and see you